All right. Good afternoon, New Bedford. Hope everyone's doing great on this Thursday. Uh, everyone's getting off work, getting ready to head home soon. Uh, here with uh, Mayor Mitchell, we're going to do a weekly conversation with him and, and kind of get people a chance to ask him questions and, and just give an update generally on the big things that happen each week. Um, so it's good to see you again, Mayor Mitchell. How you how you doing over in City Hall? Doing all right, Mike. Doing all right. Mike. It's good to be back on. It's been a while. I know. Obviously, the pandemic has disrupted a a whole lot of things to state the obvious and uh, uh, but you know some things are coming back now and, and uh, this is one of them so it's good to be back uh, New Bedford guy. Yeah we were doing the kind of a weekly you know update on COVID it was kind of trying times it was kind of like a it felt like a war zone or wartime kind of updates we had to do given death counts and like you know it was kind of tragic I think we're in a much better place now so if you can kind of give us what's the What's the state of New Bedford as far as a COVID um, update? Well, I mean, it, so in general, in the last, really the last three or four months, Mike, we've tracked national trends. So that's to say, you know, we had the big spike back in December and in early January. And January 4th was our, our highest day. On that day, we had 263 new cases. And, and then we started a long decline down to, uh, to mid-March, and by mid-March, the 14-day average was about 18 cases uh, a day. So you're talking about oh, well over a 90% drop from the beginning of January to, uh, to March, and then it started to come back up again. Um, and now it feels like it's on a, on a higher plateau, but a plateau nonetheless. So in the last couple of weeks, I don't have, we'll have the numbers tomorrow, but uh, we're at about 40-ish cases, around right between 40, 45 cases, uh, a day as the 14-day um, average. Um, the positive rate is uh, at the same time over the same period has gone from 15% plus in the beginning of January down to about 4%. Now it's come back up to a little over six. Yeah. So it's it's leveling off. And I think what people can draw from this is there, there are a couple of different conclusions, right? Um, so the first is that um, you know, we're in a better place than we were in January, but we're at a level now that's similar to where we were last spring when we're up around 40 cases a day. And you'll remember last spring, there was a lot a lot going on that wasn't great. Closures and, and the, you know, the mortality rate uh, was, was significant and uh, it was disruptive. And so it, it still is in many ways. This virus is still very much around. Uh, another uh, conclusion is that... Um, the vaccines are working. This is probably the biggest conclusion. So although the cases have come back up, they are more and more concentrated among younger folks. Um, and that's because the, you know, there are a few different reasons for that. But the, the primary reason appears to be that um, that older folks have gotten their vaccines. And uh, so so very few of the, the new cases uh, are among people 65 and older. And that's that's where the vaccines have been rolled out over the last few months. So that's good news because those are the people who are most susceptible. And, and sure enough, hospitalizations have gone down at the same time. The, the death rate has gone down at the same time. So that's that's really important progress. You know, the key now is just to get it over the... There isn't a finish line. It, it, you have to be careful with the metaphors you use. But you know, what we the one metaphor that does make a lot of sense is that we are in a bit of a race between um, the variants, uh, especially the ones that are taking hold now, the British variant, uh, most especially, uh, and the vaccines. The faster we can get vaccines out, uh, the closer to some sense of herd immunity uh, we'll be able to um, you know, to get to, and and uh, we don't know exactly when that that will be. But we do know that holding back the virus through continued mask wearing and social distancing is important. I know that some, some, in some states that's been loosened up. I don't think that's a good idea. I think we have to continue to play it safe. Um, it's not to say there should be you know, more lockdowns, but it is to say that the simple act of wearing a mask and separating yourself out from others is, is still key to hold back the spread of the virus. And then separately, um, you know, we really need people to, you know, to take uh, the vaccines. It's, they do work and they are safe. And I know a lot of people say, well, what about Johnson & Johnson? What we saw this week with Johnson & Johnson and the pause and 
And, um, you know, that just, just goes to show that uh, that particular vaccine is safe. So how do you know? And uh, what I'd say to people is this, um, what happened to um, the patients who got sick from the j and vaccine apparently was a, were, were st- extremely rare occurrences. So almost 7 million doses of J&J have been administered and, and six individuals got sick. It's not to minimize what they've gone through, but it's to say, you know, it's, it's less than a one in a million chance. And that's, that's not, that, that's a pretty low risk still. But nevertheless, uh, and this is probably the more important point, the FDA and the CDC still put the brakes on, right? So it, it, it gives you confidence that those federal agencies are on top of the stuff and even minor what some might characterize as relatively minor risk are still taken seriously. So, um, so I, I think that should give everybody confidence that this is going to work out. And if they can identify certain groups of people who shouldn't be taking those vaccines as a result of their review right now, then that makes it even safer. So uh, I think I encourage everybody to get, uh, to get vaccinated uh, because uh, that's the way that we're going to get uh, through all this here in New Bedford and everywhere else. Yeah, Michael Emery has a good question here. He says, um, have you gotten the vaccine? If not, are you planning to, or are you going to rely on antibodies? Because I know you got COVID um, yes. last year. So are you, are you, you, they still recommend you get the shots even if you get COVID, right? Yeah, I think the, the short answer is I'm going to get vaccinated. Um, uh, I won't be eligible until the 19th, right? That's when everybody 55 and, and under uh, is, is eligible. I, I you know, I made the decision back in January not to, I don't want to, I have to jump the line, right? So a number of public officials had said, look, I want to take this, I want to take the vaccine in order to set an example. And there, there's a certain logic to it. I, I just, I just felt differently about it. And I felt like I didn't want to, you know, go ahead of somebody else who was more vulnerable. So uh, I didn't do it. And then uh, as luck would have it, I caught it the next, caught the bug in the next week. So it's just, it was just my luck. I'm also not 90 days out from my infection. I think in fact, it might even be like today or tomorrow that I'll be 90 days out. So I, I plan to get vaccinated uh, sometime, sometime in the next couple of weeks. And uh, maybe New Bedford guy can come film it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely let us know. Um, yeah. And when, in a public service announcement for people is there's um, on the waterfront, the New Bedford's Waterfront Vaccination Center on uh, Hervey um, Ave will offer COVID-19 vaccine appointments at its clinic, which will be administered by the CIC Health and FEMA Vaccine Clinic. That's Saturday and Sunday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. I'll post a link in the comments. People can read that. What? Yeah, so let me just I'm glad you raised that. So let me just give out a little bit more information, Mike, if you don't mind. So yeah. you can go the fastest way to get the vaccine, is just go on the state website and go and, and that can take you to uh, to Circuit City in North Dartmouth, or if you want to do it through your healthcare provider, South Coast Health, Greater Bedford Health Center, Hawthorne, they have they all have vaccines. The city has been pushing out vaccines through mobile clinics as well as a, a clinic at the Andre McCoy Rec Center. Uh, those are those are running uh, in, with, uh, in conjunction with uh, the Greater New Bedford Community Health Center. We're getting people vaccinated. We focused on the elderly in the city, which uh, was really important to do, especially um, right out of the gate. Uh, and then we have you know another clinic uh, that will be uh, that is being run by uh, a FEMA by, by a federal contract, as well as at times uh, certain days by the by the health center. And if, if you want, you can go on the websites to get to sign up uh, for vaccinations there, or you can call, there's a, let me give you a number, 508-984-2661. That's a New Bedford number. And uh, you can get hooked up that way uh, if you want. So I know uh, uh, we, we post when Governor Baker goes live a few times a week to do a vaccine update. And he, yeah. gives a, he kind of gives a state level that we're on a pretty good path. Is, is New Bedford on an equal footing with other cities in Massachusetts? Are we lower as far as like a vaccine percentage or higher or where we kind of stand as a city? No, we're lower than the state and um, which is, which is a concern, obviously. Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one is that had been supply. I think frankly, the supply in this part of the state wasn't what it was in other parts of the state, unfortunately. And that might sound parochial to some folks outside of, 
uh, Greater New Bedford, but to folks in Greater New Bedford, I'm sure it comes as no surprise. Um, I'll just leave it at that, not to sound too cynical about it. But I, I think it's less about that now than more about um, our workforce and as well as some other barriers. You know, we still have, we, we our population skews elderly. We have a lot of elderly who don't have access to computers, don't own computers and are, you know, are just not on the internet. So I think that inhibits signing up. You can sign up by phone, of course, um, but, you know, the internet is, is, is easy, easily the fastest way to, to to get that done, and that's that's something that everybody's on here. Uh, there are language barriers, as we know. Um, the other thing is, I think, and this is a reason that I think has really not gotten um, its due in the national media, and that is um, in places like ours where people mostly work defined shifts, um, it's harder to break away from work and, and to, to go to a vaccine appointment. If you're a professional, if you're somebody with a – uh, a more flexible schedule, you can just sign up and break away and get it done and it's, you know, go about your work. But if you, you know, if you're working nine to five or, you know, 7.30 to 3.30, whatever your hours are, uh, it, it, it's harder to, uh, to, to, to break away and, um, uh, and go, to a, go to a clinic. So I'd say to everybody, and this has worked with the waterfront site, you know, if you're an employer, uh, we, we just we urge you to do two things. First, encar strongly encourage your employees to get vaccinated. It's the right thing to do, but it's also good for business to have a healthy workforce. And secondly, relatedly, make the time for your employees uh, to, uh, to get it done. And uh, we saw good examples of that among a lot of the seafood processors on the waterfront this weekend. We had 1,100 people go through the, the waterfront site at uh, the, the former EPA terminal. And uh, that put a good dent in things. And, and um, so we need more days like like that. And we couldn't have had that success if it weren't for you know, a, a number of the uh, the owners of those companies stepping up and uh, partnering with us. Yeah, I think, so Lisa White, she brings up a good point too. And I think you put it on Twitter where the mass vaccine sites were kind of way away from the city. I think Gillette was like the closest one. So they, they kind of took care of Boston and around that area. And we kind of South Coast seems to constantly get ignored by legislators that ain't up in Boston. Is that, is that a fair statement to say? Uh, it's not far off. Um, yeah, I, I think in general, Mike, you know, you saw, I mean, I, <laughs> I tweeted about that at one point. I was just really surprised at how much attention that, that yep. tweet got. I tweeted out a map of uh, locations around Massachusetts, and that caused some consternation in state government. Uh, but it was the you know it's the dead level truth that they, they they were thinking Boston first, as as is too often the case. Um, you, you know, we, we were able. They they did look when they finally got around to it. They looked for sites in the city. They looked at places like um, the Kings Highway Plaza, the former Kings Highway Plaza. Um, you know, there are a couple of other strip malls they looked at. Nothing, nothing really worked in the city. And so they, the mass vaccination site for Greater New Bedford uh, became the former Circuit City site uh, in North Dartmouth, and, and, uh, which is just as well. But the problem, it, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but because uh, I think it's, you know, it's got the parking and it's fairly well suited. It's large enough. But the problem is, you know, there are transportation barriers. Uh, of course, not everybody has a car, not everybody has a computer, there are language barriers. And so, and then there is the, 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 um, the workforce barriers that I, I just mentioned a while ago. So what we're, we're doing, Mike, is, and this is another component of our efforts that um, is really important. We, we're really, in some ways, just in a very general sense, doing house calls. We're, we started off uh, our vaccination efforts by going directly to, this, to the senior living facilities around the city and just the, rather than having waiting for them to come to us at the McCoy Center, we went right to them and set up, had a day in which we got everybody or just about everybody in the building done we went to the next building, next building, next building. And that, and that got a lot of seniors inoculated. Uh, we're doing mobile clinics uh, now. We're doing, they have a, a program to inoculate homebound seniors as well. So if, if you have a family member who's homebound, you can call that same number that I just mentioned. I'll repeat it, 508-984-2661, and get them signed up for that. That's a little bit of a slower process because they, you know, they've got to go from place to place and wait for observe people after they get the shot. And it's one one person at a time. But 
you know, there are a lot of people in the city that have to have to get their shots that way. So um, I, I think in the long run, Mike, we're just going to have to continue to chip, chip away at it. Yeah. So there's a lot of obviously um, parents out there concerned with their kids. So we've done several months of the hybrid learning. And I think we've now in our second week at the New Bedford Public Schools to kind of go in full back, you know, fully back into the five day program. How is yeah. the how's it going for the first two weeks? I think it's going really well. Uh, the school department has done has been really organized and really careful and really conscientious. And I say the school department, I mean from the superintendent to his administrative staff to all the principals, the teachers, the custodians. The custodians have done a, a phenomenal job across the school district and keeping things clean. They've all been very. They've, they've done it with such great care, and that's why we're able to successfully bring kids in on a hybrid basis uh, since the start of the school year. New Bedford, of the 10 largest school districts in the state, New Bedford has been the only one that uh, has been hybrid the whole time until now recently we're, you know, in full in person. So um, every every other school district in the state, um, Fall River did a good job. They did it almost for the full school year. Uh, but, you know, once you get out of Southeastern Mass, uh, all the other cities did, were refused to, um, you know, to go that way. And I think we proved that you could pull it off with our kids – uh, kept up um, better than a lot of other kids in, in, in other urban districts. And so, you know, it, it took um, it, it took a lot of doing and um, and, I, and I feel very comfortable. Um, I feel very comfortable where, where things are. The kids are catching up. They're not all the way back to where they were in terms of their learning, um, uh, where their learning would be. They're, they're um, 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 you know, where they are in terms of their performance on like benchmark exams and other markers that you look at to see progress. But and I think, you know, a lot of kids here and other where and, and, and in other places fell behind last spring when, you know, it wasn't set up well for remote learning. But this year, uh, the New Bedford Public Schools have done a really good job. So uh, kind of big news, I guess, yeah, earlier this month. So uh, Chief Cadero is going to you know, retire. So I know when he um, was appointed, it was, you know, we had a, a process. I think it was narrowed down to like three people and then he was selected. Is that going to be similar this time around? And do you know the timeline of that? Yeah. So, well, so he just retired, of course. And, um, you know, he retires after five years on uh, as chief and 35 years total in the, in the department. Um, you know, and, and, he accomplished an awful lot. Uh, if you think about it, I think just a, a word about that is, is appropriate. You have, you know, a chief who, you know, held every position in the department and who, um, you know, in a difficult time was able to, you know, to re reduce, you know, opiate deaths through a number of means, including establishing a, a, a diversion program and a number of other programs, the you know, clergy ride along program, a number of other, uh, outreach programs that really did work. Um, you had um, you, you had a uh, a chief who you know really worked hard to upgrade the equipment in the department. He really started to pivot in the direction not only of community policing, which was really important, but also uh, in the general direction of of using data uh, to make decisions of, uh, about deploying resources. That was really important. Um, I think he did a really good job during the pandemic, during the time during a time of, of protest. I mean, New Bedford stood out as a city uh, that didn't have uh, the kind of violence that we saw uh, across the country, and including here in the Northeast. Uh, and I think a lot of that is a tribute to uh, you know to the way that he dealt with um, dealt with the matter in a very sort of engaged way, didn't run away from it at all. And the last thing is, it's you know, it's proofs in the pudding. It, it he. Um, the crime in the city has dropped considerably during his time in office, both uh, violent crime as well as property crime. And and so New Bedford's a safer city today, and that that allows us to do a lot of other things and continue to improve the city's quality of life, and school system uh, to attract investment here. So he goes out on a on a, on a very strong note. Um, you know, we have uh, so Deputy Chief uh, Paul Oliveira will take over as the acting uh, chief. I mean, we, we did the same thing uh, a few years ago after the death of David Proventure. Um, 
Dave Lozat, the uh, deputy chief, took over, and then and then we launched a search process. We'll do the same thing more or less uh, this year. I anticipate um, what that looks like exactly. Uh, I'd say it's not going to be much different from last time in the way that it's in terms of the process. Um, but you know, we'll iron out those details and have an announcement um, at some point, probably later this month. Yeah, if you have a question for the mayor, throw in the comments. We don't do the call-ins because it's social media, it's not radio, but just post your comments in the question and I'll, I'll throw them out there. Another question is, so last night the uh, planning board approved the special permit for a dispensary on Cogswell Street. I guess it'll be the first uh, possible if it gets through. What, what's the, that approval doesn't audit guarantee it. Now it has to I mean, go to your desk or how does it work to actually get a dispensary approval? No, I think the planning board was the last approval for it because they had, they had gotten through. Um, this is South Coast Apothecary, and uh, they got their approval from the State Cannabis Commission. That took a long time, uh, an awful over a year. Uh, uh, so they so they've been waiting on that, but they're you know they they can proceed now, and they're going to be establishing a place uh, right off of. Uh, the highway right off of 195, right, right by Market Basket on Cogswell Street. So, um, you know, they're 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 heading down that that road. We also have, um, uh, you know, there's been. I mean, it's like people wonder. Well, so this is the first marijuana business in the city. It's actually not. And uh, I think one of the things that was lost during the pandemic was the ARL, which is a manufacturer, uh, set up shop in the. The business park. So they've been up and running almost a year now, uh, rough, roughly maybe even a little bit longer than a year. Uh, and maybe it's a year in June, but what, whatever. It's They've been going for a while now and, um, you know, they haven't had any issues uh, with them. So, um, you know, how long it'll take South Coast Apothecary to set up shop on Cogswell Street, I'm not sure. It's really just a matter of how quickly they can get their building built and their business up and running, which I suspect would be a matter of uh, a matter of months. So that is there like a whole city agreement that happens with you and and because some yeah, of that I know it, it happened over you know like a year and a half ago. It happened yeah you know, well before the pandemic. So that's in place and it'll pay you know the city effectively a sales tax uh, on on um, on the the, you know, the goods they sell and so um, and so that'll you know that'll help with city uh, revenues uh, going forward. Uh, that, that probably won't hit the city's um, city's accounts for you know for some while still probably not another year or so. And that that money is an earmark; it just kind of goes into a general fund. Is that oh, how that works? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me look and see here. So Andrea Stone asks, I'm not sure if it's been asked, but just wondering who will be appointed to the board of health. The information isn't up to date on the city's website. I don't know. If yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know who's so whose term offhand, Andrea. I'm not sure whose term is 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 up uh, as yet. So, um, you know, that, um, you know, we're obviously for all of our boards, you know, we look to, to appoint qualified people and uh, we invite I encourage everybody, if you're interested in serving on a city board, please uh, go on the city's website. Just there's a really brief one page form to fill out with just basic information. You can attach a resume, but we really do. Sometimes we struggle to find people interested in, in um, uh, boards and commissions. And so I, I, I encourage everyone, if you if this is something you'd like to do and contribute to your city, um, you know, please fill out that form and let us know that you're interested. And we, you know, we can't do a show without this topic coming up, which is fix all the potholes. <laughs> so what's the, what, yeah, I know. Um, I know you guys have the new machines, those kind of things. I out found there. one the other day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> on one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, what, what's the status of? I know we we, we go over this every year. Um, uh, you know, well, some this, of the, tis, tis the season. This is this is when it gets bad, right? Because it, although this winter wasn't too bad, um, you you know it, things do freeze up. And the water and the water freezes up below the surface, right? The water gets into the into the cracks in the road and then uh, the ice underneath expands and then leaves a cavity when it melts and then the, then the, uh, the, the surface collapses onto it and that's how you get a pothole. But um, 
Yeah, I think what we've seen is what I've say to everybody, as I've said before, is, um, you know, we work on it all the time. We consider uh, and the city spending more money now on a routine basis than it has probably in, in our lifetimes. Uh, um, it, we for a long time, the city did not have a road program. And and so, you know, when you don't have a constant program, a program that, you know, you're committed to a year and you're out to devote a certain amount of money to um, to fixing the roads that things will fall behind. And for many years, the city just relied on the funding it got from the state through the so-called Chapter 90 program. Uh, under that program, the city is, gets about $2 million a year, a year to maintain over 300 miles of roads. It's not nearly enough. And so during my administration over the last five years or so, we've augmented that, uh, that those funds first with about a million, a million dollars a year, and then we've increased it. Uh, so the point at this point, I think we're at, I think we're at $2 million uh, a year. And in fact, last night, the city council approved uh, my request for, uh, for uh, $2 million this year for road improvement. So we're increasing the amount of money. Uh, and we're at a point now where more money is going into our roads on a consistent basis than a, a, a long time, a little more longer than I can remember. And, and we're going to have to keep it up. And, and, and then eventually you will see fewer potholes, fewer cracks. And, and um, But, um, but it, it, it takes time. It takes time for it to deteriorate, and it did. And it takes time for it to build back up to a point where you know, you don't see those potholes anymore. We'll do a few more questions. Um, you know, we recently had another death on Route 18. Someone hit one of those, uh, you know, came onto that median and, and hit one of those um, potters kind of. We've had a few deaths on Route 18 in the, the last couple of years. Is there any kind of safety studies being done on Route 18 since we've kind of upgraded that area? Um, well, we upgraded it, in fact, as I think a lot of people would have experienced to slow the cars down. So from you know, that accident, if it's the same one that I think you're referring to occurred at the, the Walnut Street intersection, and uh, it was a very, a very unfortunate incident. I don't know the, the details and exactly why that, that particular accident occurred, but uh, we haven't, I'm not aware, Mike, honestly, that uh, that there have been more accidents on Route 18. The, the, the renovation of of, and it's not to be dismissive, it's a, it's a long, it's a limited access highway. And so cars do tend to travel at high rates of speed. And so that has to be, you know, enforced by the police to make sure that, you know, we're not, you know, there, it isn't risky, but the, one of the, one of the outcomes, one of the byproducts of renovating the rebuilding Route 18 from Walnut Street all the way down to Cove Street was that, uh, that by adding more um, traffic lights, it tends to slow the whole thing down, right? So if you remember cars driving, you know, for like a full mile, you could drive for almost a full mile on Route 18 before the, the, the renovation without having to slow down for a, a traffic light. That's no longer the case. There are, there are more sets of traffic lights along the way. And so it doesn't allow for like a, you know, drag strip um, um, effect uh, for for motorists, so I, I so I don't know. It'd be worth looking at the accident data, but I'm not sure that it's actually ticked up. So you, as you as you brought up, uh, you know, last summer we had a big thing with um, protests around the whole country, not just New Bedford. And it was all a lot of it was based on policing. We're going through the George Floyd trials right now, um, and then the city kind of did a study, and it was a you know presented with some changes that are going to happen. Can you kind of give a summary of what's going to change with the New Bedford Police Department in twenty twenty one and going forward? Well, we 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 undertook a uh, a study on the department's use of force policies, and uh, this is something that um, the Obama Foundation had. Um, had initiated, we uh, adopted it. We thought it was a good idea, and so we launched a process that was um, with a committee that was chaired by uh, City Councilor Brian Gomes, and included folks from law enforcement, folks from a number of uh, uh, civic groups, uh, to take a look at um, uh, whether those policies could be improved. And so, so there's, and, and also really just to, uh, to start talking about how 
um, you know, things can get better in, um, in, in the city and how there could be, you know, a, a deeper level of trust as between the police and, and you know, certain, uh, certain neighborhoods. And um, I think the process worked very well. It, it yielded um, it yielded considerable discussion, uh, real serious discussion, and the whole group took it very took it very seriously. Uh, the recommendations I accepted in full. Uh, they made uh, a good deal of sense, although the policies that were in place uh, were fairly modernized. They did they, they could use could have used some tweaking, and uh, I think the upshot is that. Uh, well, th those are getting those improvements are getting written into the um, into the, the, the policies, and the, and we'll we'll, uh, we'll all be better off for it. So things like chokeholds and you know, those weren't allowed anyway, and they're certainly not not about to be allowed. Stuff like that, um, you know, certainly part of the, the discussion. But there's also you know a commitment to doing certain uh, implicit bias training and and other things that I think you know, can only uh, improve trust in, in the department. We'll do two quick questions. Um, Danny West says, will Kings Highway ever be completed? I like to look at rent so. store space. He wants to rent store space out there, but he thinks it's going to be a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a project that's been in the pipeline for, I think ever since I've been in office. It's, it's there, we, we've done certain projects in the city. So we, Road, the roadway, we were talking about roadways. Let me just, so for everybody's benefit, um, you know, as I said, we get some money directly from the state. The city is now putting a lot more money in. There are also these uh, one-off major projects like Kings Highway, like Route 18, uh, a couple of years back, that fall under the Transportation Improvement Plan under the state. The state gets federal money to do these larger projects. And we, in New Bedford, have benefited uh, from that program because we do a lot of planning. We try to, and, and, and by doing that planning, we get, we tend to get to the head of the line for, for money. Uh, the Kings Highway project is one that's been in the pipeline for a few years now. And the, the idea, the idea fundamentally there is, you know, you, to rebuild the, the roadway to make it, uh, make the turning radius is better, but also to better integrate the, uh, the 140, um, north intersection, right? So you can get on and off of 140 much more, uh, much more easily there. That's the that's the plan. Well, the, the plan ultimately is to be able to go straight off of 140 into that plaza, and uh, that will that will help with the backups on 140 that we often experience. If you go on 140 north, you take the Kings Highway exit. Sometimes, you know, that backs up for a while, and people are waiting around uh, for for too long. This work will help with that. Like other highway projects, it just takes time. This is this is not a this is not a city project. It's a project that the city did some planning around, but it's a state contractor, and uh, you know we certainly tell we certainly urge them to uh, you know to keep it moving so that our because our, so we don't want our residents to uh, you know have to experience delays. And uh, but you know I would just ask uh, it, 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 while we push the state to. To hurry up, we just ask everybody else at the same time to be to be patient. Let them do their uh, let them do their work, and it is like every construction project. It's a hassle when it's going on, but once it's done, it's a lot better. Yeah, I do the final question. Um, how much money will New Bedford receive from the American Rescue Plan Act? So I know the you know President Biden signed that recently. Is a lot of money flowing to the cities. Um, anything that we're getting, and what are we going to use it for? Uh, so the city's getting a considerable amount of money and it's, uh, well needed and we're pleased to get it. It's a great question. So the city's getting a little over $68 million, uh, under the plan. And that, you know, that funding, um, is really a once in a lifetime, um, uh, opportunity. My, um, we don't know yet what we can use it for. We're, we'll, we will have a better idea, um, what we can use it for when the Department of the Treasury comes out with regulations that will provide that guidance. You know, the statute says certain things, but it's uh, about what we can use it for and what we can't use it for. You can't use it for tax cuts. You can't use it for to, to you know to um, pay down you know, your, your pension obligations. But uh, what we but um, there are there's a lot of gray in there, and then hopefully the Department of the, Tre of the Treasury regulations can clarify that. Um, we, so in general, we'll have to, um, once we have those regulations, we'll be able to speak about it in more detail. I'll just say that 
just a couple of things. It's really important that we understand that this is just going to happen once. It's not going to happen again. And so therefore we should be thinking about spending the money, not on recurring expenses like payroll, right. But on one-time items, you know, to one-time investments and how those investments happen um, will be left up to a process that we'll, we'll put in place. You know, we want people's ideas for sure. And this is a good opportunity to, to say, look, if you've got good ideas, let us let us know. Um, you know, but what we'll what we'd like to see, you know, from nonprofit groups and others is, you know, some good ideas for one time investments uh, that include um, private sector money. We'd, it would be really good if we have. You get this money from the federal government, and then we can use it to leverage more money uh, from the, the private sector. So, for instance, if a nonprofit organization wants to, you know, just take this example, wants to fix its roof, the roof of its building, we'd say to them, all right, we'll pay half of it, but you got to raise the other half, something like that. It's just a rough example. But you know, if we can, t- we can take this money and get others to contribute more, then the city will be much better off. So that's that's the idea. But there's there's a lot more to come um, on that, Brian, in the in the weeks ahead. So I, I can't get you to commit to just cutting property taxes in half, huh? <laughs> well, we can't. It's, it's well, expensive under law, under law. In fact, there are a number of states that are bringing um, lawsuits on that very provision, Mike. Um, yeah, so. Uh, that's just, uh, but for now, until until some court strikes it down, that's not even an option. All right. I appreciate your time. And I guess we'll uh, see you next week if you want to close for a quick minute. I know you're going to get to a phone call. So, yeah, thanks for that, Mike. No, I, it's great to be back on. It's great to see you. Um, we really uh, appreciate you know, what you've done over the course of the pandemic to get, uh, to get the word out. And I just emphasize to everybody, you know, let, we just have to stick with the social distancing, the mask wearing, the other precautions now. And, so that we can let the vaccines catch up. And then again, I just encourage everybody to get the vaccines. We should do some um, some footage of my getting uh, my vaccine in the next few weeks, Mike, uh, just, to, just as a reminder for folks. But uh, I look forward to getting it for myself. My, my wife's been vaccinated because uh, she's in the healthcare business um, uh, a while ago. And, you know, my, my kids are, uh, you know, they could, they, they'd be eligible to get it. Um, after April 19th, like, like, uh, everybody else under 55. And so they'll sign up. So I, you know, it's definitely something my family's doing. I just, uh, commend it to everybody else. Yeah. I recommend it. And I'll, maybe I'll go there together. We'll both get it to show people that it's, it's something we should be doing. So there we go. No tears, Mike. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's important. I really think it's important if we're going to get out of this and by the end of 2021. All right. I appreciate your time, Mary Mitchell. We'll see you next week. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Mike.